Funk, and this is podcast number three. Uh, this whole effort started out that I was going to talk about my evolution as a writer, and uh, then when I got to the fruition of that, various books that I wrote, wrote uh, I would explain kind of the context of that. But what this is turning out to be, what it's morphing to be, is uh, my autobiography. So hope you can put up with it. Uh, when we left on podcast number two, uh, I was on a plane going to Vietnam. Uh, incidentally, uh, it was a commercial plane. It was like American or TWA or Delta, one of those. Um, I don't remember which one. And the stewardess were just like regular stewardess. Um, and, and they were all female flight attendants back in those days. Um, but imagine the emotional challenge they had dealing with all these guys heading to Vietnam and some of them not returning. Um, when I was sitting in that plane, somehow I knew that there were on average, 77 Americans being killed per week in Vietnam. And I also knew that there were approximately 540,000 troops uh, in country. That slang meaning, uh, if you're in Vietnam, another way of saying that was in country. And actually that 540,000 number was the top number ever of American troops in Vietnam. So I had you know, pencil on paper and I figured out, well, what would my odds be of surviving all this? And frankly, they look pretty good. Um, I, because I was a combat engineer, I wasn't an infantry soldier, so uh, I, I knew I had better odds. So, you know, what I had to discuss is my feelings about going to Vietnam. Uh, Unequivocally, I didn't want to go. Uh, it, was, it was terrifying to even anticipate. But but I was not a conscientious objector. I I felt that there were times when our country had gone to war and it was the wrong thing to participate. And as far as Vietnam was concerned, I had been aware years earlier of a policy of the United States government called um, policy of containment and it stated that any country that was being overrun by a communist government or communist um, forces that the United States would come to their aid. So but somehow that whole narrative uh, you know dissipated in the air and by the time I was going uh, there were protesting in the street because of the military industrial complex and uh, capitalism and greed and so it was a whole different story the plane landed in Benoit that wasn't very far from Saigon I think a little bit north and it was on a good Friday I tried not to read too much into that. Uh, the first thing I noticed when we were on the ground is there was some guy, some shirtless guy operating a forklift and he wasn't wearing a flak jacket. And I thought, well, apparently he feels that there's no mortars or rockets coming in. And um, that was a little bit reassuring to make me feel safer. Ben Wall was a holding area, much like that Air Force Base had been just outside of San Francisco. Um, he could be there for, well, it was a few days until it was decided where you're going from there. Alone. So they had this thing called a Lister bag, which was chemically treated potable water. Um, and it was very hot and humid there. And, and I was at that potable back so often I was given uh, an assignment uh, to, keep, to keep them full. And so was another guy named Arnold Horvitz. Um, 
And little did I know um, that I had already met my two best friends that I'd have in Vietnam. One was Arnold. The other was back up to when we were uh, in the Air Force Base in San Francisco, South of San Francisco, West Southwest of San Francisco. Uh, no, Southeast. <laughs> anyway, uh, that uh, the guy, the guy that said private. Well, I have to back up a little bit more. When my sister-in-law was trying to reach me to say goodbye, and with her living accent, they were paging, would private sunk please report to such and such, private sunk. And so this guy on the top of the next book to be, he went private sunk. Can you imagine a name like that? Oh, brother. Well, that was Ken Lubecker, and he was my second best friend in Vietnam. So we we all were boarded on a plane, a C-22, C-122, I believe, uh, going towards Pleiku. And there were about 30 of us on that plane. The, the seats were like really cheap lawn chairs strapped to the sides. And we're on our way, and then were informed that we were going to land at some Air Force base because there was so much crossfire over the Pleiku airstrip at that time. I thought, well, that's not very welcome to me. Um, so we stopped for lunch. I wasn't very hungry. Uh, but there, the radio, there was a radio on. It was talking about Nixon had this new plan uh, to get us out of Vietnam. So that was... Uh, well, I think it was encouraging, even though it didn't suggest anything was going to happen quickly. So when we landed, when we did land at Pleiku, we were shepherded to Engineer here, Engineer Hill, and we sat around, and 24 of the 30 of us that come in on that plane um, were trucked off to Ben Het. Uh, that was located near the Laotian border. It had a lot of U.S. casualties. Uh, so I was glad I wasn't on that truck. Uh, the six of us that remained, uh, we started talking to each other and then we, we discovered what we all had in common was a college degree. Apparently, someone decided that we could be more use we stayed on Engineer Hill and uh, be spared the battles, the ravages of that had. If I never had a good reason for a college degree, that that was it. Now, Engineer Hill was home to the second Engineer Brigade, and there were approximately 2,000 troops there. Now, what is a troop? These are all things I had to learn. The troop basically was one individual. Um, so Arnie, Ken, and myself, we were relocated. It's on, on the hill. We were taken over to the um, 509th Panel Bridge Company. And attached to that was another platoon that was from some floating bridge company. A little bit about Ken and Arnie. Ken was from suburban Cleveland. Uh, a tall guy with blonde hair, had green eyes. Uh, his liberal views often shared, never softened. <clears throat> Arnie was medium eyes, dark hair, dark eyes. He was smart and you couldn't help but know it. His conservative views at the time would shift dramatically over the years. I might even say, keep shifting. Okay, now just for the record, Engineer Hill was a brigade. Okay, it had X number of battalions. A battalion had X number of companies. 
a company had X number of platoons, a platoon had X number of squads, and a squad had X number of troops. So we're back to that individual person. So there were three platoons, or kind of like three working platoons, bridge building platoons, and then a fourth one that was for support people. Okay, a sergeant had each platoon, and um, there was a first sergeant. These were all career men. Um, also, there was three officers, one captain, two first lieutenants. They, they were, you know, I don't know, they may have been second lieutenants. It was a long time ago. So how did I feel the first few days? Well, again, I think terrified says it. Uh, but really, very quickly, you you felt a very, very strong sense of camaraderie among the enlisted men. And the enlisted men is everyone that wasn't an officer. Um, and I think these sergeants were enlisted men too. Yeah, they were. So we were the, below the sergeant level, we were the peon and less than men. Um, you know what I remember after I was there a few months? Oh, you know what, I, I have to describe what our housing situation was like. They, they were called hooches. Well, a hooch was really so much more elaborate than what I anticipated they were broken up into uh, double rooms, so everyone had a roommate. You you had your own bed, and above your bed was like a wooden cover, um, and the, then it had wooden sides. It was all designed so that if there was a, a mortar attack or rocket attack, you had as much protection as possible from how these uh, hooches were constructed. And they had, at the upper half, they had windows, but they really quite, well, they weren't windows. They were um, plastic covered over chicken wire. Uh, and again, uh, quite, quite uh, luxurious. So, anyway, I was in my hooch. It was uh, early evening. <clears throat> and some guy came walking over from the shower from, from another platoon. He's going, where's Funk? Where's Funk? And I came out of my room. I said, what? And he said, what does intrepid mean? And I said, well, fearless. I, I never knew why you needed to know that was such urgency. Uh, but it did tell me that uh, people thought that I had a good vocabulary. Uh, you know, when I went to St. B boarding school for high school at Marquette University for college, <clears throat> I thought I knew something about diversity. Um, but I found out it, we were all the same people, it, even if we lived in different parts of the country, came from the same kind of families same kind of social economic backgrounds. The army was totally different. Uh, but uh, whether you're from the hood or the farm, you really did depend on each other. So rather than building bridges, because so many had been built by the time I got there, uh, our panel trucks were being used to haul asphalt and build bridges. Now, the panel trucks were traveling in a convoy. The security for the convoy was a converted tank mounted on a wheel chassis that could ride along. I'm turning the page here. With the other trucks at the end of the other trucks and will serve as security. It had one fifty machine gun and two M sixties, plus our own uh, our own weapons. You're never 
were supposed to say guns. Now, initially, they were M14s when I got there, but then they switched out to M16s. So, lucky me, I was assigned to the gun truck as security. So, you don't have to think too hard to realize that if the enemy wants to take two people out, the first people they're going to go after are the two guys operating the gun truck. It would be me and the other guy riding with me. I'll pick up on the gun truck on the next podcast. <laughs>